Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a wintry Monday afternoon, even though spring this morning sure looked like winter with the snow coming down. I like the special effects. Yeah. Anyways, welcome to Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. Hi, everybody. Notice I'm in a good mood. I'm in a real good mood. Why? Because what all of you did on test number two. I think the average was about 90, which is quite good. Test number two, now I can tell you, is usually the hardest test of the semester. I've had classes where the average was 70. Not with you. Thank you. Oh, do I feel good. See, my heart's looking real good. Anyways, today I'm going to be going through test number two answers. I'll cut it out of the video. But by tomorrow evening, I will post a private YouTube and I'll send out the UL, URL for that YouTube. So if you're not here today and you want to see the answers to test number two, or if you want to go look at them again, they'll be available to you. All right. Uh, on a personal note, over the weekend, I think it's the third or fourth time it's happened since I've been in this house, which is almost 25 years. Boy, that's a long time. It's a great house. I love it. And my neighbors are great, too. My kitchen sink clogged up. Now, later in the semester, I'll teach you the organic chemistry, how to unclog a sink or a bathroom drain or a kitchen sink. But I thought I'd share this with you. Now, hopefully on your screen, you see a bottle of instant power here in Grease Drain Opener, and it really works. I'll tell you later on the story, but this stuff works like a charm. It's a mixture of KOH, potassium hydroxide, and sodium hydroxide, both bases. Now, if you go to a place like Home Depot or other big you know, home improvement stores, I'll have a whole long aisle of drain cleaners. Every one of them except this one is an acid. This is a base. And I'll tell you later on when we get into the part so you understand why it works, this works. And I've used it three or four times and I've had a number of my students I have two, and I tell the story in both general chemistry and chem 170 over the years have used this stuff and works like a charm every time. Now, when you buy it, it's the only package or bottle on the whole shelf, length of shelving of drain cleaners that's in a heavy Ziploc plastic bag. And on the Ziploc bag, it says in red letters, wear eye goggles and rubber gloves when you use it. Guess what? I do. And the only thing I do differently, like for my kitchen sink, is I've learned where it says, let it sit 15 minutes, I give it 45 minutes. But it's important to follow the directions after that to put hot water. Since my kitchen sink is far enough away from my water heater, that takes about a minute or so before the water gets hot, meaning cold water, I grab a bucket and fill it with hot water from my utility sink in my utility room. And I carry it up and I do about two of those. And it was totally stopped up or like 99%. And boom, works like a charm. And my brother-in-law has used it for their bathroom here. I don't have to worry about too much air loss. It's already gone. But anyways, no, I still have a lot left. But my sister has always had for years a number of dogs in the house that shed 
and that clogs up their drain in the bathroom. And so this works like a charm. I've had students who have used it. They all tell me it works like a charm. So that's the hair and grease uh, drain cleaner or hair and grease remover drain cleaner. Use it if you ever need it. And that's test number two. Any questions on test number two? Well, I'd have a question. After two tests, what grade am I getting? Good question, thank you. Now there are two ways of determining your grade. Now, this is assuming you've handed in your labs. Those of you who are missing a lab or two, hand them in. You'll get some points. All right. Method number one. It's not the president of the United States. Three more rings. Two more rings until my answer, our service answers it. One more. That's a Bluetooth phone hooked up to my cell phone. Stop. Oh, it listened to me. All right. Z equals test number one score plus test number two divided by two. Now, if this score, is greater than or equal to 90, you're getting an A right now. If it's 80 to 89, you're getting a B right now. If it's 70, to 79C, I don't think anybody's lower than that. I don't think anybody's lower than a B, which makes me happy. All right, now there's a method two. Because you get to drop the lowest test, the method two at this point in the semester is, look at your two test scores, test one and two. Again, this is assuming that you have handed in your labs and whichever that score is Y, if the score from the one test is 90 or above, you're getting an A, 80 89B, 70 79C. Thank goodness nobody's getting a D or uh, failing. I've had semesters, unfortunately, where one or a couple of students are. I try and help them, but there's only so much I can do. And that's your current grade. Now, there's still a lot of points to go to test the final. That's about 400 points out of what is a 630 plus your labs. But if you have any question about your grade, always feel free to see me after class or during a my office hour, which are Tuesday and Wednesday.
One second, I gotta do something. All right, well, in that case, it's time to get back to what we were talking about on Wednesday. Just to remember, don't forget the lab we did Wednesday, distillation is um, due this Wednesday. And in labs, if you have problems, come to my office hour or ask me after lecture. All right. Now, last week, I started talking about esters. Esters are derived from carboxylic acids. Esters have this form. This is an ester. I thought I told you the story last week. I had only once it's ever happened. It happened at the other school when I was teaching organic there. There they call it come 1212. And her name was Esther. And everybody said, all right, we're talking about Esther's. Her head would snap. Are you, are you calling me? <laughs> it was funny. She was happy when we were done with Esther's. All right, so this is an Esther. Now, how do you name that? I'll show you, but named the R group bonded to the oxygen of the ester as an alkyl group. Change the name of the carboxylic acid used to make that ester by dropping the IC and the word acid and adding ATE. I don't have it here, but a number of years ago, I had a really sharp 170 student who came up with a second way for most of the time to do part two. And I'll teach you that also. And the question is, give the IUPAC name for the following molecule. How do you do that? Well, you look for what's different. Ooh, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen? You get your attention like that. And we have carbonyl, oxygen. On the oxygen is R prime. On the carbonyl carbon is R. We have an ester. So how do you do that? This is our prime. What group is that? It's an ethyl group. Now, if this were H, we'd have one, two, three, four carbons. That would be butanoic acid. And you drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. The carbonyl carbon is always going to be one, so you don't put that down. And that would be ethyl butanoid. Now, what the student I had came up with, except for when R is a benzene ring, this works. And what did the student do? First of all, name R prime as ethyl, an alkyl group in front. Next, how many carbons 
are in this chain, longest chain with the carbonyl carbon. Butane. And now drop the E at butane and add OATE. And notice you get the same answer, and you should. But this only works when R is not, when R is not a benzene ring. So let's go through it again. You identify this is an ester, and the carbons attached to the oxygen attached to the carbonyl are prime. You name as an alkyl group in front, ethyl. And then the IUPAC way, which when R is not carbon, a benzene ring, I wouldn't use, but it works. If R prime was acid, what carboxylic acid would that be? Butanoic acid, drop the IC and the word acid and add O-A-T-E or A-T-E. Now, the student came up with, if R is not benzene, how many carbons long is chain? Four, butane, drop the E and add O-A-T-E. And that's how you do esters. And here's one for you to try. Give the IUPAC name for the following molecule, three points each. And I usually call this method second part 2A, or you can use the second part the student came up with. I don't take credit for somebody else's work, to be. And I always say to be or not to be, that's the question. Oh, I did it again. I think Shakespeare came up with that. I forgot which one of his plays. It's one of those we read in high school. All right. And don't forget the boat when you're done. If you're done early, please be patient. You've heard me say this, but it's true. I try and give everybody time to finish. It looks like just about everybody's finished. So let's move on. How do we determine what's the IUPAC name? Look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen. Ooh, carbonyl, oxygen on that carbonyl. Carbons I'll call R prime. On my carbonyl, car I have carbons. And this is an ester. And now, What's the R prime? You put that in first. That's an alkyl group. That's a methyl. And then I'll use the 2B or not 2B. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can't help myself. I think it's wired into my brain. But anyways, one, two, three, four, five. Pentane. Drop the E at O-H-E-E. -E. 
the carbonyl carbon is always number one, but you don't put that number. And that's methyl pentanoate. Say that five times quickly. No, you don't have to. Now, don't tell anybody, but it's a special gift to you. I will not ask you to name esters with substituents on R, because it gets pretty interesting. Let me show you. And this will never be on a test because it's got a substituent on the R group. What is this? An ester. My R prime is ethyl. If I use the 2B method, oh, I didn't say it. Shakespeare's phrase. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hexane, drop the E, at O-A-T-E, hexanoate. This is carbon one always, two, three, four. And now we have, oh, your good buddy, the methyl group. And you get ethyl four methyl hexanoate. And you might look at that and say, how come ethyl doesn't have a number? Well, it's the R prime. But I will never do this R in an ester on my test and the final will not have substituents like methyl here. That's just a little too hard at this level. All right. And a question would be, give the IUPAC name for the following molecule. How do you do that? You look at this, and this one I'll do. Well, I'm being selfish. Now I'll share later on. You know I do. And what's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Got my attention. Carbonyl, oxygen, the oxygen. I have our prime. On the carbonyl carbon, I have R. Oh, it's a benzene ring. You can't use method 2B. Why? Well, there's no longest chain. It's a benzene ring. So how do you do that? R prime is the alkyl group it is, and that's isopropyl. Then, you have to use, if this were an H, what carboxylic acid? When, in other words, would be used to make that benzoic acid. You drop the IC and the word acid. And you add A T E. So this is isopropyl benzoate. One thing I should tell you if you look at a lot of the things you purchase with ingredients labels, especially cosmetics and personal care items, you look at the ingredients. And I'll teach you more during the semester. You see something with a name with. A-T-E or O-A-T-E ending, it's an ester a lot of the times. And a lot of your cosmetics and your skin creams use a lot of esters. If I look at the clock, it's about time to take a break. So we will, but do come back afterward when we come back I'll tell you a very personal story where Dr. White was a very, very bad person, bad Dr. White.
So you're going to have to come back to find out. With that, let's take a five-minute break. I'm going to get up and stretch. See you in five.
I'm back. All right, we were talking about esters, and I just showed you how to do an ester when R is a benzene ring. So, Give the IUPAC name for the following S. Oops, almost gave it away. For the following molecule. Oops. <laughs> Remember, for this, take the carboxylic acid that would have been used to make that. If R prime was H, drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. Hence. <laughs> All right, let's do this. What's different? What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Carbonyl, oxygen. Here we have R prime. Here we have a benzene ring, but I'll call that R. And we have an ester. Name R prime is the alkyl group it is, T or tert butyl. I'm going to be a lazy organic chemist, and we call it T-butyl. And then this part, benzoic acid, would be used to make that. Drop the IC, the word acid, add A-T-E, and that's T-butyl benzoate. And that's how you do esters. Now, one thing I've held off on doing, yes, I did, was talk about the nomenclature of carboxylate anions. And one of these centuries, I'll write a slide. I'm lazy, I haven't. But how do you name carboxylate anions?
name M plus the cation as the element it comes from in front. And then two, Me, I was going to write it one way. Let me do it this way. Use 2A or 2B, or not to be, that's going to go any of it. Use 2A or B2 from ester nomenclature. So how does this work? All right, question is, give the IUPAC name for the following molecule, 3 points each. What's different? Ooh. Carbonyl oxygen here, but it's an anion with a cation. And I have carbons here. And this is a carboxylate anion. So Na plus comes from Na, which I hope you know is sodium. And then this part, I can use the B2 method the student came up with. Three carbons is propane. Drop the E at OHE, and it's sodium propanoid. And that's how you do it. Again, the cation you name as the element it comes from in front, just like the R prime for ester. Sodium. Then use 2A or B2 from the ester nomenclature I just taught. In this case, when R is not a benzene ring, you can use the student's method, three carbons, propane, drop D at OATE. Again, like esters, I will not, as a special gift to you, don't tell anybody I'm being nice, Shh. but I won't put any alkyl groups on the R of carboxylate anions. Let me open up something I don't have open. Everybody see the periodic table? I use this for Chem 112 and general chemistry because it doesn't have names on there. But you should know from my class the following. I think I mentioned it the first day. Li is lithium, Na sodium, K potassium. You should know Mg, magnesium, Ca, calcium, obviously carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and the halogens and sulfur and nickel, platinum, and palladium. And that's all really I use in the periodic table. Even though if you want to give me some gold or silver, you can. Ooh, that reminds me, a quick little side story. Chemical symbol for sil uh, sil chemical symbol for silver, say that five times quickly, is AG. And a number of years ago, and it happened about two or three times. I was driving to ECC for teaching. That's when I was doing face-to-face, -face, well before the pandemic. And I pull up the stoplight in front, there's a car with a really interesting license plate. And the license plate was H-I-H-O-A-G. And it took me about 
two and a half seconds, I started laughing. I said, wow, that's a cool license plate. And what does that stand for? Hi ho silver. And if you grew up when I was a boy, the most popular TV program for boys was the Lone Ranger. And it always started out with him on his horse galloping down a hill saying, hi ho silver, away. And silver was the name of his horse. Oh, in case you're wondering, do I have time? Oh, I do. My license plate is this, the RKW. And I can, yeah, I have time for a quick little Dr. White story. A long time ago when I lived in Chicago, wow, that was a long time ago. When I first came back from getting my PhD at Michigan State, I moved in Chicago on the north side in Roger, East Rogers Park, not far from Loyola University, but far enough away, about a mile and a half away. Uh, but anyways, in order to meet people, because I didn't know anybody, um, a lot of my fraternity brothers have, had graduated and left the area because I went to school at IIT in Chicago, but to meet people where I was living and I had an apartment two blocks from the lake, that was nice. But anyways, Lake Michigan, I said, I'm gonna join the Democratic Party and help out. And I became a precinct captain. I got to meet everybody on the block where I live, square block, which we had like 800 voters. There was a lot of people. And after I'd been doing that a while, someone asked me, could you help out this one guy? He had been appointed to finish out a term for a state representative, and he was running now to get elected for the first time. And his name is Lee. I won't use his last name. And I sure. I said, how can I help? He said, well, are you up for a really bad job? And I said, sure, I can do anything within reason. And he said, well, the four or five weeks before an election, I should be at the L stops in our district at about 6.30 in the morning, handing out flyers, or I should have four people with me handing out flyers. And could you organize that? And the next thing he said was, and can you call me about 5.30 or so every morning to make sure I'm up and getting there? I said, sure, I'm an early morning riser. I'm usually up by 5 a.m. So 5.30, quarter to six to make a phone call? No, no problem. To organize, at that point, I was a section head of process and product development at AXO. No, uh, no, I just, at that point, I'd already been working. I had just been appointed section head of process and product development North America. So I know how to organize people, get them to do what I need to get done. So I did that and he won. And that election night, I was at the, his party, bunch of people, he gets up, gives his acceptance speech and everybody's clapping. And then he finally says, I have one more thing I have to tell you. Everybody said, what? He says, you know what the best part about today is? Dr. White won't call me at 5.30 in the morning to wake me up to get to a L station. Everybody laughed and it was true though. And he came to me afterward and said, what can I do for you? I said, well, you can give me money. I can't do that, it's illegal. And he said, if I can get you a state job, what do you want to do? I said, no, I've got a really nice job I love. He said, all right, I got to do something for you. And he said, wait, I'm on a committee. It hasn't been announced to the public yet. And that is, we're going to start coming out that everybody can get vanity license plates. And you can be one of the first in the state and get one of the names that haven't been taken. You know, the number one was the mayor or governor of the state. And those just numbers, early ones are taken. I didn't want that anyway. So I'm talking to my sister. I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to have KW. And she's my initials. And she said, no, you've got a PhD. Flaunt it. She'd be proud of it. And I am, but put it on your license plate. And that's how DRKW became my license plate. And I was one of the first people in the state of Illinois 
that had a vanity license plate. And to this day, I still use it. All right, let's get back to carboxylate anions. Remember, name M plus as the element it comes from in the front. Then the rest use 2A or B2 from the ester nomenclature. And here's one for you to do. Give the IUPAC name for that molecule. I hope you enjoyed my stories. It's been an interesting life I've had. And please be patient and you know the rest of what I'm going to say. I'm looking over here. I don't know if you can see it. I don't think you can. Can you see untitled poll box on my on your screen over to the left? I didn't think you could, but I can. That tells me how many people have said yes, so I can wait until most of you are done. And I will. Oh, at the same time, I was able to get my sister and brother-in-law. Ah, Louis, Luis, thank you. I will keep them coming. You'll hear another one in about five, 10 minutes. That's a doozy, a really good one. Yeah. I'm not proud of, not at all, but it's still a good story. All right, my turn. How do we name this? Look for what's different. What's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? You know, get your attention like that. Oh, I've got a carbonyl. On that carbonyl, remember carbon double bond oxygen. This is an oxygen with a negative charge. And lithium is a cation. I'll put as M plus. Carbon's here. This is a carboxylate anion. Have you noticed how I'm secretly doing repetition and burning this into your brain? It works. And how do we name it? The M plus we name as the element it comes from in front, Li lithium. Since R is not a benzene ring, count the carbonyl carbon plus the carbons in R, And that would be name it as the alkane you would have used to make that. Drop the E, add O A T E. And that's lithium pentanoate. Well, let's do one more. These are fun. And that's a benzene ring. Your turn. Give the IUPAC name for that.
in case you forgot. Remember here for our benzene, drop the IC in, the word acid, and you put ATE in there. Yeah, it looks like everybody's done. So I'm going to do it. What do we have here that's different? Carbonyl, oxygen with a negative charge. Ooh, a sodium cation. I'll do M plus and R. Now, this is a carboxylate anion. And if we look at this, we name M plus as the element it comes from, sodium. And then, oh, we can't use B2 because R is a benzene ring. So if this were an H, OH, that would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC from benzoic and the word acid, add ATE, and you get sodium benzoate. And I mentioned it earlier, but I'll mention it again. Let's see if I can find it. And if you notice on your screen, let me make sure it's on your screen. Notice they have potassium benzoate. I'm surprised. Usually it's sodium benzoate. And that's something that protects flavor, a preservative. How does that do that? I have no idea. But usually it's sodium benzoate. Now, why do they go to potassium? Well, a number of years ago, Medical science came out and said, too much salt and sodium in your diet raises your blood pressure. And fortunately, I found out they weren't lying. My doctor told me about that and said, you better bring it down after I had my yearly physical, which includes a blood test. So the pop companies, remember stuff that's in a can or bottle that's carbonated, non-alcoholic. I'm from Chicagoland. We call that pop, not soda, said, oh, we'll change the sodium benzoate to potassium benzoate and sell it as, look, new, low salt, pop. And it didn't taste as good. I'm surprised 7-Up has that, maybe because of the citric flavor of it, 7-Up, which I do like. I like Dr. Pepper, too. And Werner's is the best. Oh, that reminds me. And there, my favorite is Werner's has sodium benzoate. And here they just call it a preservative. Now, I might have mentioned this, but if you go to Juul and other places to sell it, but Juul has it, and I don't get any kickback, Werner's is a very spicy, highly, and I mean highly carbonated ginger ale. And I love this stuff. I think I got two cases in the house for emergencies. <laughs> yep, emergencies. And that's, no, we're not done yet. There are two types of nomenclature question. One is give the IUPAC name for the following. And the other is,
draw the structure for. Now, how do you do that? As with all organic names, you start from the right and move left. OAT ending, that can either be an ester or a carboxylate anion. How do you tell which? You look in the very front. If that's an R prime, it's an ester. If it's a M plus, or no, at this point, you don't know that, hold on. The name of an element, it's a carboxylate anion. Well, ethyl is an R prime. Remember, esters look like this. So if this were an E, hexane, six carbons. At the end, and I always put it on the right, you have carbonyl, oxygen. What's our prime? Ethyl. And you know there are four bonds to carbon. So I'll put in my hydrogens. Let me do one more, then I'll let you have some fun. If we look at this one, what's different? Oh, I've got a carbonyl. I always like to write, sorry about that. I draw structures before I think of what the heck I'm saying. Bad habit. Oh, come on. That won't be the last time this semester I'll do it. And let's do this one. And the question is, draw the structure for sodium butanoid. I'll do this one. Start from the right, move left. OAT ending tells you either have an ester or carboxylate anion. And if we look in the front, that's an element. So this is a carboxylate anion. If that were E butane, four carbons. And it's carboxylate anion. And what's M plus? Sodium cation. Oops. Now, you don't have to put the charges there, but I do. I think it looks cool. Can I tell you, Dr. White's always trying to be me a cool dude. And that's how you'd have sodium butanoid. Again, start from the right. OAT ending tells you either ester, if in the front is an alkyl group, or a carboxylate anion in the front if you see a element name. And here, it's the structure, and that's how you do it. I better share. People will think I'm being selfish. And it's your turn. Draw the structure for isopropyl octanoid.
Have you noticed we're getting into the really good stuff of organic chemistry now? Not the beginning was bad, but this is just more juicy and fun. And yes, I work with carboxylate anions, and I also work with, <clears throat> excuse me, um, esters. In fact, a number of key molecules I had to make for my PhD thesis were esters. They were used to identify molecules I made from reactions I don't teach in this class, or even a two-semester organic you don't teach. All right. How do you decode this? Know what to draw. Start from the right, move left. O-A-T-E ending. That can be a ester, if you have an R prime in front, or a carboxylate anion. If you have an element in front, well, isopropyl is a R prime. If OATE ending were E octane, eight carbons, one end, and I'm going to always do the right. You can do the left too. I just don't. I have my carbonyl oxygen. What's our prime? Isopropyl. And now I know there are four bonds to carbon, so I'll put in my hydrogens. And there you have isopropyl octanoate. Oh, let's do another one. Here's another one. And remember, I haven't said this in a while. If you have a question, ask. Because in my universe, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. You should always feel free to ask questions. In class, you can do it in chat or Turn on your mic and ask. Yep, I got my speakers on. <laughs> when I first started in Zoom, I forget to put my speakers on. I'd tell the student, is your microphone on? And everybody else said, well, I can hear it. And I looked, ah, turn on my speakers. I think everybody's done, so I'll do it. Start from the right, move left, OAT ending, meaning you could have an ester or a carboxylate anion. Since I have an R prime in front, it's an ester. If this were, a, oh, I can't do any. What do I do? Well, for benzoate, drop the IC and the word acid, and that's benzoic acid. But instead of having an H here, we have the R prime. What is that? Methyl. Oh, brain freeze. I think I had too much protein for lunch. That's working on my brain. And that's how you do methyl benzoate. Oh, let's do some more.
It's potassium 1S, I think. Did I tell you I was always first down in a spelling bee? Hold on, this is going to be bother bothering me. It's two S's. I was right the first time. Sorry about that, but sometimes spelling is not my cup of tea. And why don't you draw the structure for potassium heptanoate? I think everybody's just about done. So how do you decode this? Know what to draw. Start from the right, move left. OAT ending can be either an ester or a carboxylate anion in front. Oh, that's an element name. So it's a carboxylate anion. How do you do that? If this were an E, heptane, seven carbons. at one end, and I'm gonna always do the right, you can do the left, I have my carboxylate anion. What's M plus? Potassium. And then there's four bonds to carbon, so I can put it in my hydrogens. And that's how you do esters. Now, oh, I forgot, hold on, time out. Before you show up, I always turn off the proofing in Microsoft Word because it doesn't like a lot of organic names. Now, switch is off, but something you should know, esters are responsible for the flavor and fragrance of many fruits, flowers, and I should also have vegetables. If you smell a banana or taste a banana, Dr. White doesn't like bananas, but when you make an ester, and I will talk about it, it's pentyl acetate. That's acetate from acetic acid. And the uh, that's a common name. The IUPAC is pentyl ethanoate. Nobody uses it. And when you smell a banana or taste it, it's that ester. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the smell of roses. Ah, they're so nice. And in roses, scented roses, there's a lot of esters. 
And here's some of them that have been identified. You can see Mother Nature is really, really amazing organic chemist. If you look in Wikipedia, which is pretty accurate for organic chemistry and chemistry in general, you can see all these different esters in nature. And allohexanoate is this, and it's in pineapple. And if we go to ethyl cinnamate is one of the esters, also the aldehyde. And let's see. Here's an ester, ethyl pentanoate in apples. Apple has more than one ester. Here's isobutyl acetate in cherries, raspberries, and strawberries. Apple has this ester and others, and so on. Orange, next time you smell an orange, it's this ester right here, nonal caprolate, and there's another orange ester too. So esters are in vegetables, fruits and vegetables. And that gives them their taste and the smell. Now, interesting thing, Mother Nature created in certain animals esters that when a female of an ant species is in heat, wants to breed, and her body, the female animal, is ready for breeding to attract the male, they emit a sex pheromone. And I think all, uh, don't bet, I wouldn't bet on it, but I think 99.9% .9 of all sex pheromones are esters. And if you've ever had a dog go into heat, and she'll attract all the males in the neighborhood. Now, perfumes are mainly esters. Next time you put on a perfume, if you use it, or men, they call it cologne, you're putting on esters. And part of that was, I think, people's imitation of animals trying to attract the opposite sex. Now, do I have time? I do. Time for a Dr. White story that I'm not proud of. When I was in high school, early in high school, I, and I wasn't the only one, my friends could do it too, some of them, I had a habit of getting my mother ballistic at me. I mean, she'd get really mad. I'd do something, say something stupid, and it was probably real stupid. Oh, she'd get mad. And my father would come home from a long day of working at his pharmacy. And my mother would get upset. That, you know, this is what he said. And he'd come up to me alone. He said, let's go into downstairs. Let's talk. And I love my father. We were very close friends. He'd look at me and say, all right, what stupid thing did you do now? And I'd tell him, he said, come on. Don't be stupid. And I would. That was part of growing up in high school. He did stupid things. And boy, did I. And he said, you know what you got to do now? I said, yeah. And what did I have to do? My mother's favorite perfume was Chanel Number no. 5, which is quite expensive. And back then, I lived in Lincoln. We lived in Lincolnwood. And not far away by bus where I didn't drive then, so I took a bus, was a um, Marshall Fields, which a number of years ago was bought by Macy's. And I go in there and go to the perfume section. Here, a high school student guy going to perfume section. I'd say, I need a bottle of Chanel number no. five. And they'd ask one si what size. And depending how stupid and mad I did and how mad my mother was, 
was how small the bottle had to be to get me out of the doghouse. And after a while, when the women behind the counter got to know me, I'd show up and they'd say, all right, did you do something, say something to get your mother mad again? Yep. And if you're not familiar with Chanel number five, And if you notice on your screen, a big bottle it was cheaper then, but it was still big. It's $160. Back then, I could get by with smaller ones like this. It was still expensive. I had a part-time job in high school. I learned finally, keep your mouth shut. Don't get your mother mad at you because it costs money. But it was funny. The women there got to know me quite well. All right. Hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> now it's funny, back then it wasn't, it was expensive. Now, let's go back to sex pheromones. Over the years, people have been trying to find, is there a sex pheromone for humans? And so far the answer is no. But every once in a while, you'll hear on the radio, oh, the scientists found a sex pheromone. And the last time, I think it was about five, six years ago, some scientists at some school found that male sweat attracted females, women. And obviously the answer is probably not because I don't think how many men go to a supermarket or a big box store and buy sweat smelling cologne, no, but they still try. And they also market it on TV. If you look and they got one, I can't think of the name, but it used to be Axe and before that uh, Canoe. And you'd see a commercial, some nerdy guy put on some of this cologne and then walk out and all these beautiful women jump them. And the thought process they're trying to make you think is, this is a sex pheromone, you put it on and it'll attract beautiful women. Probably not, but who knows? I've been on places where I've been in meetings or something and some person has so much cologne on, some guy, they better not light a match near him, he'll catch fire. Because usually they're in ethanol or in alcohol. All right. An ester, in case I've been giving you a headache, aspirin is an ester. How it kills pain, I have no idea. I know how to make it. And notice aspirin has a carboxylic acid, an ester, and a benzene ring. If I notice I went a minute over, it's time for a break. Time flies when you're having fun with esters. And let's take a five minute break, come back in about five minutes from now.
Time to get going. Oh, I haven't used this one in a while. Time to get going. Time to get comfortable in my chair too. All right. <clears throat> And we're talking about Esther example in our daily life, aspirin. I'll talk more about ibuprofen later on in the semester. Now, how do you make an ester? The most important way is Fischer esterification. Take a carboxylic acid, react it with an alcohol, the presence of acid catalyst, H+, and you make an ester. And the carbon in R prime with the hydroxyl group is the carbon in R prime and the ester bonded to this oxygen. The carbon in R prime of the alcohol with the hydroxyl group is the carbon in R prime bonded to the oxygen, the ester. Now, this is called Fischer esterification, uh, name in honor of the great German organic chemist, Dr. Emil Fischer, who discovered this or created it. Now, sadly, research Dr. Uh, Fischer was working on killed himself, killed him. And I'll tell the story. Now, this is a lifetime achievement coming up with this reaction, but he's known for his work with sugars that when we get into carbohydrates, I'll talk about. And I believe he won the Nobel Prize for that. All right, let's take this first spin. I like that, let's take this first spin. No, we're not going out driving. All right. Question is, give the organic product or products or the following. And how do we do that? We look for what's there. Ooh, we've got two organic molecules now. Things are getting a lot of fun. And this first one, carbonyl, hydroxyl group, R group, carboxylic acid. Second one, carbon, carbon, car hydroxyl group, alcohol and acid catalyst. And this is a meal uh, Fischer esterification. And you make an ester. Here is my R prime. The carbon with the hydroxyl group will be the carbon this oxygen is bonded to. Do you break carbon carbon single bonds? No. So I have my R group, my carbonyl, Oxygen, what's our prime? Three carbons. Notice the N carbon of these three is the N carbon and propyl that I add. I know there are four bonds to carbon. And that's the ester I made. And I should say, esterification and making different esters and other compounds is in organic chemistry. Perfume organic chemists are the most lucrative, highly paid in the United States, not the world. In fact, I tried to be one, but my background and research experience wasn't what they were looking for. And I got into industry and other place, which I was quite happy with, still am.
your turn. Give the organic product or products sort of following. I should mention this material, carboxylic acids and their derivatives, esters, will be on test three, and test three will be similar to test two. Uh, general knowledge, by what functional group do you smell from flowers, esters, nomenclature, and reactions. And like test number two, test number three, We'll have three or four synthesis problems, but most of them will be reactions. All right. How do you determine what product or products are made? You look for what's different. This first one, ooh, carbonyl, hydroxyl carbons, carboxylic acid. This one, carbon, car ooh, hydroxyl group on a carbon, alcohol, and then H plus acid catalyst. For this one, usually use sulfuric acid. And what do you get? You make an ester. So what's R? What's R prime? Remember the carbon with the hydroxyl group is the carbon this oxygen is bonded to. So my R group are my carbons here. I have my carbonyl, that's where all the fun is. And then oxygen, what's my R prime? Isopropyl, the center of three carbons. I know there are four bonds to carbon, so you can watch me put it in the hydrogens. And that's the ester you make. Oh, let's try one more. And here's one more for you to try. Give the organic product or products are the following. Now, I will tell you, a benzene ring alone will not react with an alcohol plus acid. A benzene ring, even though it's a functional group, will not react with alcohol and acid. But other things do. I was just thinking after class today, it's Monday, so I get to put the garbage out in front of my house for tomorrow's pickup by my driveway or on my driveway. Oh, the joys of owning a home. And it is.
Well, it looks like I think everybody's done. So what do we have here? We've got a benzene ring, but no, I have a carbonyl with a hydroxyl group, carbonyl, double carbon, double bond to oxygen. And I'll call this R, carboxylic acid, carbon hydroxyl group, ooh, alcohol. Hold on. That looked awful. Let's clean it up. Alcohol plus acid catalyst. And this is Fischer esterification. You make an ester. And what's our benzene ring? What's our prime methyl benzene ring? Carbonyl carbon, which is here. Oxygen, what's our prime methyl? And you just made methyl benzoate. And that's how you do it. But on test number three, there'll be some synthesis problems. So let's do one. And the question is, what two things do you react with? Acid catalyst H plus to make that molecule. Your turn. And this is the fun part of organic chemistry synthesis. But then I'm biased, I'm a synthetic organic chemist. <laughs> but it is the fun part. All right, so how do you determine what two things you react with acid catalyst to make this molecule? You look for what's different. Ooh, what's not carbon, carbonyl, or hydrogen? And I have carbonyl, carbon double bond oxygen. That carbonyl carbon has an oxygen. Carbon's here, I'll call R prime. Carbon's here. And I have an ester. And how do you make an ester? You start with a carboxylic acid plus an alcohol and acid catalyst, which we have. What's our this? What's our prime? Also ethyl. So R is two carbons. Then I'll have my carbonyl of the carboxylic acid. So this carboxylic acid, propanoic acid, plus our prime is ethyl. And I have ethanol. If you react propanoic acid with ethanol acid catalyst, you'll make ethyl propanoid. Oh, let's do one more. I'm gonna roll here.
Let's see if you're up to the challenge. What two molecules do react with acid catalyst H plus to make that molecule? This one's a little tougher, but let's see if you're up to it. The challenge. Can you do it? I hope so. All right, my turn. Now, if we look at what are we reacting? Two things. What are we making? What's different? Carbonyl, oxygen. On the oxygen, I have carbons, benzene ring, but I'll call that R prime. On the carbonyl carbon, I have benzene ring, I'll call that R. And what do we have? An ester. And how do we make an ester? This year, esterification. Carboxylic acid plus an alcohol and acid catalyst. What's the carboxylic acid? R is a benzene ring, benzoic acid. What's the alcohol? R is a benzene ring, phenol. God, that's the worst looking phenol. Hold on, don't look. I can do better, I hope. And I did. If you take benzoic acid, react with phenol in the presence of acid, you'll make that ester. And that's how you make esters. And it turns out esters are used a lot in our society for many products to use. Well, I just remembered a story. And that is when I worked for a company, Unichema Chemicals, which was an international company, they used to be part of Unilever. And then they got that division got sold to someone. I don't know who owns it now. But anyways, I had already had a reputation in the chemical industry, which is why they hired me for solving tough problems. And one time I was on a trip to Europe and Unichema had headquarters in, did I talk about how to pronounce Gouda? I think I did. Have you ever been to the city where they make the cheese Gouda? No, it's pronounced Gouda. Anyways, they also had a big ester plant in England. And one time I was at Europe, in Europe, in Gouda, 
And the CEO comes into me. I was in a meeting and I talked to him, sure. We're having problems at our ester plant in England. Can you go? I said, I'm here for a long time. When I go to Europe in that company, I'd usually be there from two to four weeks at a trip. That's a long trip, but at my level, you got also put in the finest hotels and you ate in the finest restaurants. But after four weeks, that got tiring. It was good to be home. But so I went to England. And one of the interesting things about my career in the chemical industry, most chemists and organic chemists stay with one type of chemistry, functional groups. But in my career, I've worked in many different companies, different functional groups. And the thing I've learned is one area of chemistry and industrial chemistry, everybody knows that problem. The other area, they're not aware of it. So I went to England, saw the problem and said, it's a process problem, which I had already solved at another company for another type of chemistry. And I told them, this is what you gotta do and do it. Let's try it in the lab first. You never experiment in a plant before you try it in a lab because you're going to waste a couple hundred thousand dollars in chemicals, maybe. Not a good thing. We tried it in the lab at work. And one of the things that is I did as a PhD chemist, which not all PhD chemists did at companies, once I solved the problem in the lab, I'd supervise or help supervise it done in the plant to make sure it was done right. And that gets things solved. Sounds uh, straightforward, but as the best mentor I ever had, Sid Shapiro used to tell me, common sense is not common. And he'd say, Sonny. And I'd look at him and you're not my father. And we'd both laugh. Don't call me Sonny. And <laughs> we would always do it anyways. So let's move on. If you have a book, which you don't have to. We don't have time for mechanisms I can show you, but we don't. All right, click, switches off, but you can have cyclic esters. And for some reason, somebody decided, let's give them their own name. And they're called lactones. And they're made from hydroxy acids. Uh, see page 303, let me show you real quick. If you have, this is one, two, three, four, five carbons, even though the ring with the oxygen is six atoms. If I were to take this hydroxy acid reacted with acid catalyst and heat. I don't put it on the slide, but you got to heat it up too. You'll make that lactone. Click, switches off. This will never be on a test, but lactones are used in our society. Now, once you have esters, what can you do with them? Well, ester acid hydrolysis or hydrolysis acid hydrolysis of an ester. And that's where you take an ester, react it with water and acid or acid and water, and you get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. And let me rewrite it in a prettier way. I don't know about prettier. And sometimes you'll see me write the reaction this way. You take an ester, and react it with acid and water. Water acid doesn't matter which goes first. You get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester, which means the carbon with the oxygen in our prime is the carbon with the hydrox group in the ester. I'll say that again, slow motion. The 
carbon, the carbon with the oxygen, R prime, will be the carbon and R prime with the hydroxyl group. Now, before we go through an example of this, this turns out to be a very important reaction. We say that about all reactions. But this one, we'll come back to why. Right now, and wherever you are, like in my office where I am, where would you find right now acid and water? Uh, time's up. In your stomach. Your stomach has acid. Yep. Thank you, Charles. Your stomach has acid and water. You notice I've been drinking water all afternoon, which is a good thing. You're supposed to get about, what, eight glasses a day to keep you healthy. And guess what? Dr. White likes being healthy. It turns out, and I'll teach you this later in the semester, all fats and oils that you consume are esters. And your body, your stomach, breaks it down by acid hydrolysis of the ester. The ester reaction I'm showing you now. Bet you didn't know you're a walking chemo organic chemical plant. You are. All right. Time out. Something I forgot to do, I better do now or forget again. There's one common ester nomenclature name you should know. And that's this one. The IUPAC name, which nobody ever uses, is ethyl. That's my R prime, two carbons, ethane, drop the E, ethanoate. Nobody ever uses this. The common name, everybody uses. And R prime is ethyl. Now, to make this, you would use this carboxylic acid. Remember the IUPAC dropped the IC and the acid from the word, the carboxylic acid, and add ATE. Well, the common name, which hopefully you remember for test three, hint, is acetic acid. So I'll drop the IC and the word acid, and the common name, ethyl acetate. And you should know on a test, if I ask, draw the structure of ethyl acetate, it's this structure right here. And you should also know ethyl acetate is one of the two molecules used as nail polish remover. You should know ethyl acetate has this structure, and it's one of the two molecules used as nail polish remover. Up until about, I don't know, it could be off by a couple of years, five, seven years ago, if you went into a place like Walmart or that French store, my friend likes to say, I shop at that French store, Target, you would find a wall of nail polish remover five, six, seven years ago, and most of them would be ethyl acetate. But when they came out with the new super durable nail polish that you shine a UV light on, to cure, ethyl acetate didn't take that off that easily, but acetone did. And that's why if you go to that French store, Target, or Walmart, or any other place that sells nail polish remover, most of the bottles now are acetone. But you should know ethyl acetate, the structure, and that it's used as nail polish remover. Hint, hint. Big hint, again, ethyl acetate, this structure, the common name, ethyl acetate, I'll never give you a structure and ask what's its common name. I'll give you, here's ethyl acetate, draw the structure. And it's used as nail polish remover. 
All right, now that I forgot and I remembered to say that, let's get back to acid hydrolysis of an ester. And now we return to our regular broadcast program. Oh, it's Bad Humor Monday. I hope you like me injecting humor. That's who I am. How would you like an instructor that says, hi, now we will talk about acid hydrolysis of an ester. I'm already asleep. That's not me. All right, let's do this reaction. What would be the two products you would get when you react this molecule with acid and water or water and acid. What's different in this molecule? Ooh, carbonyl, oxygen, carbons here, I'll call R prime, carbons on my carbonyl, carbon double bond oxygen carbon, I'll call R. So this is R, this is R prime, this is an ester. And if I react it with acid and water, like what's going on in your stomach if you had, say, French fries or potato chip, you know, the good stuff in life, they have fats and oils in it, you'll get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. So what's our two carbons? And I'll have this carboxylic acid. What's our prime? Isopropyl. Remember, the carbon with the oxygen and the ester will be the carbon with the hydroxyl group in the alcohol. Well, three carbons, center carbon, isopropyl. And that's how you do acid hydrolysis of an ester. Again, Ester, acid, water, get back the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester, plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. And the carbon in the ester, R prime with the oxygen, will be the carbon in the alcohol with the hydroxyl group. On a test, I'll be nice. I'll put that plus sign to let you know you get two products. I don't have to, but shh, don't tell anybody I'll be nice. I'll ruin my image around here. I'll have to come in and bring my bullwhip. Oh, I forgot my bullwhip died a while ago. Over the years, I've always been into unusual weapons. I know how to use nunchucks. They've saved my life a couple of times many, many years ago. I know how to use a boomerang make a comeback, and I know how to crack a long bullwhip. Why? Because it's fun to do. In case you forgot, here's a general reaction you might want to look at.
All right, let's take a look. How do we proceed? We identify the functional group, <clears throat> which is another way of saying what's different, carbonyl, oxygen on the carbonyl. This oxygen has carbons I'll call R prime. The carbonyl carbon has carbons attached to it. I'll call R. And what do we have? An ester. Acid and water, you get back the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester plus the alcohol. So now that I know what I'm supposed to make, R is this carbonyl hydroxyl group, this carboxylic acid. And the alcohol, R prime, is ethyl, so ethanol. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's have some more fun. Everybody check their answer. Remember, I got a fast mouse wheel finger. And one of the things you'll learn later in the semester, Mother Nature makes a lot of esters that organic chemists do this reaction to make carboxylic acids and alcohols. In fact, I worked, and I'll talk about it when we get to that chapter, fats and oils. I worked for a company on the south side of Chicago, not far from White's, the old Comiskey Park, 47th and Racine. We used to make carboxylic acids from esters to the tune of about two to three million pounds a week. Yes, two to three million pounds a week. That's a lot. Oh, I forgot to do something. Sorry. There we go. And I'd like to thank all of you who are watching my videos. I hope they're helpful. I think a lot of people aren't part of the class watch them because I have X people in the class and they're like X times three views or four. Unless a lot of you are going back and binge watching a lot. I don't know about that. Now, hopefully you've all turned your clocks, let's see, spring forward. My clock house, I think I have about 14 clocks I have to change. You know, things like my oven, my microwave, my uh, coffee maker, or actually I just, it's my tea maker, but it's a coffee maker that I only make tea in. And I have a clock in my utility room, an extra clock, one in my garage, my car. Wow, I have a lot of clocks. In fact, on Saturday, I waited until I started about four or five Saturday afternoon, said, nah, I don't feel like doing it when I get up in the morning Sunday. I'm not going to stay up that late, like two in the morning. So I start early. All right, let's do this. What are the two things you make when you react this molecule with acid and water? And what's different? Carbonyl. Oxygen. On the oxygen, we have a benzene ring, but benzene alone will not react with acid and water. So that's this R prime. On the carbonyl carbon, I have a methyl group. 
I'll call R. Oops. And what do we have? We have an ester. And when you react it with acid and water, you get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that. Well, what's our methyl? What's our prime benzene ring? So you get phenol. And there you go. Oh, let's sneak one more in. Same thing. What would be the product or products for the following reaction? Uh-oh. When I'm using that pad and everything else, it opens up so many temporary files that gets overloaded. And then I have to do what I have to do. And I did. Got to close Word and reopen it. As a look on the clock, I better start doing this one. So question is, what's different here? What functional group am I reacting acid and water with? And the answer is an ester. This wasn't the one I gave you. I'm sorry. Was this the one I gave you? Somebody give me a thumbs. Thank you. All right. And what do we have in ester? And what do you get? You get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. R is methyl, R prime is ethyl. So you get this molecule plus the alcohol ethanol. 
Anybody see the significance of this reaction? This is a game I like to play, a mental game. And time's up. Well, what's this? Ethyl acetate, a certain type of nail polish remover. What's this? Acetic acid. In water, that's vinegar. What's this? Ethanol, the active ingredient in vodka. If you were ever on a desert island and you're stranded and you wanted to have a salad and a good stiff drink, you had no salad dressing, acetic acid, vinegar, you had no ethanol, but you just happened for some reason to have nail polish reacted with acid and water, you could make your own acetic acid, your own vinegar, your own ethanol, distill them apart, and you'd be happy. And with that, I'm done for today. Remember, Tuesday, I have office hours, Wednesday too. If you need help, stop by. Remember, a lab is due this Wednesday. Hand in your labs. With that, remember, in Yiddish, Gengazun means go in health. And the pandemic really, I don't think is over. And the news I heard last night, there's still a lot of people dying in Illinois and the United States from COVID. And I still wear my mask when I go out. But with that, I'll say, gang gesund, goodbye. I stole that from Beverly Hillbilly's granny. Bye now.